Good afternoon. We're pleased to be here at the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center again. Uh, thank you to Manny Lopes for hosting uh, and to Mike Curry, who's the CEO of the Mass League of Community Health Centers, and Andrew Dreyfus, who's the president of uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, for being with us today. Before I give some details on vaccinations at community health centers, I do want to give a quick update on the COVID uh, metrics. Yesterday, the Department of Public Health reported 1,920 new cases of COVID. That was on 100,271 new tests. Over 14 and a half million tests have been done here in the Commonwealth and reported. Our hospitalization numbers continue to fall. We're down to 1,358 individuals who are in the hospital and being treated for COVID, which is a 44% drop since the peak on January 4th. And 309 individuals are in the ICUs. That is also a significant drop from January. Over 987,000 doses of vaccine have been administered and we're on track to reach 1 million doses within the day. We've surpassed the goal that we set for ourselves at the beginning of phase two to be able to administer 242,000 doses a week. And today over 70,000 new appointments went online across mass vaccination sites and pharmacies here in Massachusetts. 53,000 of those appointments were at mass vaccination sites at Gillette, Fenway, Springfield, and Danvers. Over 30,000 additional pharmacy appointments will become available over the course of the week. Yesterday, we also announced the beginning today, a caregiver or companion that accompanies an individual 75 years old or older to an appointment at a mass vaccination site will be able to get an appointment as well. That's to help support those older adults that might not feel comfortable with nav navigating the vaccination process. We have heard some pretty disturbing reports of some people trying to take advantage of this program already, with some people posting online trying to get a senior to bring them to a vaccination site, or in some cases, asking to be paid to drive somebody to one. If you're 75 years or older and you need assistance going through the vaccination process, you should only reach out to somebody that you know or trust to bring you as your companion, whether that's a child, a companion, a spouse, a neighbor, or a caregiver. Don't take calls or offers from people you don't know well or trust and never share your personal information with anyone. If you're contacted by somebody soliciting to take you to a site, please report it to the authorities. Now, with respect to the purpose of today's visit, community health centers have played a unique role in the Commonwealth's healthcare delivery system for a very long time. They know their patients and they know their communities well, and they serve some of the most vulnerable and hard to reach populations in Massachusetts. And they've played a crucial role throughout the course of this pandemic helping to care for some of the populations and communities that have been hardest hit by the virus. And once again, they're stepping up to assist their neighbors and their neighborhoods and their communities as part of our Commonwealth's vaccination efforts. To get, uh, so far, over 75,000 doses of vaccine have been distributed to over 100 community health center sites across the Commonwealth. And the state's community health, community health centers received approximately 20,000 doses this week and last week they received more than 18,000 doses to vaccinate people in their communities. So far this week they've administered nearly 13,000 doses to their communities, people in their communities, and we expect that those numbers will climb as they scale up their operations. East Boston Neighborhood Health Center is currently operating four sites, one in Chelsea, one in Revere, one in the South End, and one that we just toured over in East Boston on Liverpool Street, which actually used to be their WIC site, but since a big piece of WIC went online uh, as a result of uh, the pandemic, which turned out in some respects to be a net positive, I would say, once people figured it out, they now have that capacity available to be used uh, to do vaccinations. And they've administered about 1,600 doses to date across those four locations. Here at the East Boston site, they have the capacity to do about 1,700 vaccinations a week or close to 300 a day. 
community health centers have been doing tremendous work reaching out in their communities. Uh, I'm sure Manny will talk more about that to encourage folks to get vaccinated and to help answer any of the questions they have. Uh, they gave us a lot of good advice on our $2.5 million public awareness campaign, and we expect and anticipate that we'll be working with them uh, to do some additional things as we go forward that will be more boots on the ground type stuff to get folks in to be vaccinated because it is safe and it is effective. They've also been working to increase access to sites and the other speakers here will have more to say about that in a moment based on a new partnership that's been put together to help get people to sites. I do want to also give a quick update on our small business relief program. Today we're announcing that another $64 million in grant awards are going out to 1,312 small businesses to help them with expenses like payroll and rent. Each of these Massachusetts small businesses, which had applied to either of the two programs administered by the Mass Growth Capital Corporation, meet the demographic and sector preferences that were set up by those programs. Restaurants, bars, caterers, personal services, independent retailers currently make up about 50% of those receiving grants. And to date, since launching this, these programs in October, we've awarded about $514 million to 11,212 businesses. As I've said before, this is the largest program of its kind in the country. The MGCC is continuing to do outreach to eligible business owners who may have submitted incomplete applications that are missing some of the required paperwork and attestations and certifications so that they can be considered for a grant. And we'll continue to make weekly announcements on this until the program runs out of money. Before I turn it over to Mike Curry, I want to remind people about how important it is to get a vaccine when it's your turn. The COVID vaccine is safe, it's free, and it's effective, and it will protect you, your loved ones, and your friends from getting sick. Even if you've already had COVID, and I've had many conversations at this point with a number of people who've said to me, well, I already had COVID, so I don't need to get the vaccine, right? Wrong. Everybody should get vaccinated. As the variants of this virus continue to develop and morph over time, um, all those antibodies that you earned because you got COVID may not be exactly the ones that you'll need to continue to be COVID free. It's critically important if you've had the virus that you still sign up and get vaccinated when it's your turn to protect you, your family members, and your friends. It is a crucial way for how we get this pandemic behind us and get back to a new normal. And if you have questions about the vaccine, you should talk to your healthcare provider. You can visit our website at mass.gov COVID vaccine to learn more. But we're here today in part because these folks do know their communities, their communities and the people in them know them. And they are exactly the kind of folks who are gonna help us help others make the best decision for themselves and their families and come get vaccinated. And with that, I will turn it over to Mike Curry. Thank you, Governor Baker, to uh, Lieutenant Governor Polito, and uh, who has become my good friend, Secretary Sutters. We talk at seven something in the morning. Um, and our friends at Blue Cross and Blue Shield represented here today by uh, Andrew Dreyfus. Uh, and Manny Lopes, the president and CEO of the Mass, the um, East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. We all know that COVID-19 hasn't affected everyone equally. The hardest hit places in Massachusetts are places where our black, brown, immigrant, and low income residents live. There is no doubt in anyone's mind that these communities continue to bear the physical, emotional, and financial brunt of this pandemic. And at the state's 52 community health centers, we see that suffering up close every day. In the earliest days of the pandemic, health centers figured out how to stand up COVID-19 testing and telehealth and threw themselves into contact tracing to begin to find a way out of this nightmare for their patients. At the same time, we continue to meet our patients' health care needs like we always do. That means providing high quality care while also acknowledging the realities of our patients' lives, speaking their languages and understanding their cultural beliefs and systems including their justifiable mistrust in our medical and government institutions. But importantly, our patients trust us. 
And it is that trust joined with our experience and expertise that makes us uniquely qualified to get these vaccines to the people who need it most. And we're just getting started. Just like those in the early days of testing, community health centers are building up their capacity to deliver these life-saving vaccines. Health centers have been vaccinating their staff since December, and most are now starting to vaccinate patients who are 75 years and older, and also administering the vaccine in congregate care settings like housing, shelter, housing shelters when they can, and partnering with community organizations like boards of health, hospital partners, and others who, to plan for how we can most efficiently and effectively bring real access to the patients who most urgently need the vaccine. I want to quickly acknowledge our friends at Mass General Brigham for providing 600 doses of the vaccine in Roxbury, Cape Cod, and Lowell when they were running short on vaccines. Some, like East Boston Neighborhood Health Center, as well as Lynn Community Health Center, Greater Lawrence Family Health Center, and Manic Community Health Center in Quincy, are stepping out with local partners on larger scale vaccine clinics. And with the right infrastructure investments, health centers and our community partners know we can do even more. Like funding for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, which is helping us launch a multilingual vaccine engagement campaign for our hardest hit, hardest to reach patients and those who remain most vaccine hesitant. The funding helps health centers in several critical ways, all of which are founded on conversation. First, it supports providers and staff in having respectful one-on-one -on -one talks with patients to answer their questions and concerns that truly move the needle on vaccine hesitancy. Second, through work with community health workers and community partners, it brings these intimate dialogues to the broader community, increasing the number of people who, who may want to get the vaccine. And third, through online and other channels, it directly, it directly encourages patients with culturally and linguistically appropriate messaging and discussing the COVID-19 vaccine with family and friends. Throughout the efforts, we apply two principles that we believe are foundational for health equity, treating patients as respected allies and celebrating their cultures and communities. And as we speak, health centers across the state are ramping up their operations. That means hiring temporary staff, building out new call management systems, securing or repurposing mobile units, leasing community space to accommodate more patients, partnering with other community-based organizations who are, who are key to helping us address hesitancy and to disseminating accurate and, and, and consistent information and messaging about the vaccine. This will be a major effort, the biggest of any of us can ever recall in public health. But with the combination of com continued I'm sorry, with the combination of continued strong support and investment from federal, state, and local governments, as well as our strong philanthropic community, health centers will get it done, like we always do. We are supportive and appreciative of our partners in the philanthropic community who have been reaching out and asking how they can support us in this moment. Now I'm speaking to the 52 community health centers that serve more than one million patients. That's one in seven in the Commonwealth. This is all a testament to your commitment and your tireless frontline heroes at the health centers for whom no challenge is too daunting. To the health center staff across the Commonwealth, including those here at East Boston, we say thank you. I also want to say that we know that there are people out there, particularly in communities of color, who still aren't sure about taking the COVID-19 vaccine. And we get that. Your local community health center understands that you have a lot of questions and concerns and they want to hear what's on your mind. Our staff also want to share what we know about the vaccine and what your doctors and nurses are recommending for their, even their own patients and families. And there are so many other doctors and nurses of color out there who want to help by understanding the legitimate concerns and reservations of patients and providing testimonials and taking, and taking the vaccine. I just want to lift up one in my closing remarks. Melissa Houston called me recently and she said, Michael, I work for a local hospital, but I want to give up my free time to come volunteer at health centers. And she gave, followed up two days later with about 15 other nurses that she said are ready and willing and able to come in and support the work of community health centers. So I want to say to the governor, the lieutenant governor, the secretary, and our partners at Blue Cross and Blue Shield and our friends and family here at East Boston Health Center, we're ready to go. Uh, in the advocacy community, we have a saying, we say, fired up, ready to go. 
and we're fired up and ready to go. Thank you. Try following that. <laughs> You're about to. Right. Uh, I want to thank Michael uh, Manny for hosting us, the Governor, Lieutenant Governor, and Secretary Sutters. Um, Governor, we appreciate the vital work that you, you and your team have done to mobilize against what has been what is the greatest public health challenge of our lifetime. At Blue Cross Blue Shield, we've been proud to partner with the Baker administration on a number of initiatives. Blue Cross has deployed our associates from our call center to work alongside the Department of Public Health as contact tracers and our clinicians to the Boston Hope and other field hospitals. We have waived cost shares for telehealth visits and for COVID testing, treatment, and now vaccines to ensure access to care. We, in cooperation with Secretary Sutters, have bolstered mental health care and support for our members, especially for children. And with our foundation, we've provided more than $11 million in support to organizations across the state and provided nearly 140,000 meals from our company kitchens. As we all know, as the governor said, the goal is to get everyone in Massachusetts vaccinated as soon as we can. That's why the administration, the Commonwealth, and the health centers have made extraordinary efforts to set vaccination sites up across the state. But we have to make sure people can get there. We know that one barrier, especially in the underserved communities that Michael just talked about, has been transportation. And today we want to remove that barrier. So I'm pleased to announce that Blue Cross will contribute $1 million to support the work of the Mass League, East Boston, and the community health centers across the state, ensuring that all patients have safe and free transportation options for getting to and from vaccination sites. We will not be safe as a community until everyone is safe, and that means getting everyone vaccinated as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, Secretary Sutters, and my good friend, uh, Michael Curry. And thank you to the state for providing the resources, the staffing. We just visited one of our sites, which is being staffed by the National Guard, um, and which was donated by the state of Massachusetts. And we know that here in East Boston, we are one of the hardest hit communities in the state. My name is Manny Lopes. I'm the president and CEO of East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. We are one of the largest community health centers in the country, serving 100, over 120,000 patients and providing over 100,000 vaccines each and every year. Over 50 years ago, East Boston Neighborhood Health Center was founded after a group of mothers concerned about the lack of high quality, affordable, easily access accessible health care in our community. Our mission today is still committed, our mission today is still founded on this commitment. We are guided by a board of directors who are patients of the health center. This local approach has been central to our COVID-19 response. For me and our staff, this is personal. I grew up in this community. My family lives in this community. And 50% of our staff lives in this community. This is not only our job, but this is our calling. That's why creating these vaccine centers in partnership with the state. These sites are being staffed by employees that resemble our patients, provide culturally competent care, multilingual support, and these sites are built by the community for the community. This work is not new to us. Since the beginning of this pandemic, as you heard, we set up multiple testing sites and we've processed over 115,000 tests. Thank you again, Governor Baker, 
Secretary Sutters, Lieutenant Governor, for all of your support and for recognizing and appreciating that we are well positioned to do this work. We're ready, and as our friend Coach Bill Belichick always says, we're ready to get this job done, and we're ready to do this today. So thank you again. Questions? Um, first of all, uh, we have policies in place with respect to dosing and eligibility standards, and um, and we expect those to be adhered to. And um, and we don't believe um, that there should be sort of a cattle call at the end of the day. Uh, people need to manage their dosing and manage their their vaccine, and we expect all the sites to do that going forward. Nobody wants to waste site, waste doses. Let's face it, nobody does. Um, but at the same time, people got to manage the, the dosing that they've got to the appointments that they have. And the most important message I would put out today to everybody is if you have an appointment, uh, do everything you possibly can to keep it. And if you can't keep it, try to make sure that whoever the provider is that that appointment is scheduled with knows that you're not going to be there so that they can act accordingly based on that. And if you don't have an appointment, you're not going to get a vaccine because that's the way the process is set up and that's the way it's going to work. Well, that, that didn't happen yesterday. Governor, just a quick follow-up. That didn't happen yesterday, and I just wonder if the curative should be continuing to run these sites. Well, curative operates thousands of sites all over the United States quite successfully and is one of several providers we're using here in the Commonwealth. And uh, and we expect our providers to operate on the terms and the rules uh, that we put in place. And the most important one I want people to get today is if you don't have an appointment, you won't get a vaccine. Now, several times over the course of the past few weeks, and I understand this because, you know, we have a limited amount of supply coming from the federal government and a lot of anxiety from people about wanting to get vaccinated. And I completely understand that. Um, but it's important for people to understand that uh, if you don't have an appointment, if you don't have a scheduled appointment, there won't be a vaccine for you. And there have been rumors at a number of these sites over the course, and not just on the on the mass vac sites. There have been rumors that have spread to some of the provider organizations as well. Um, I understand why people are anxious, but what everybody needs to understand here is there will be appointments. We're growing our capacity. If we get more from the feds, which we anticipate and hope that we will at some point in the not too distant future, more people will get vaccinated as well. But the big issue is you need to have an appointment to get vaccinated. Governor, do you think there needs to be a, 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 a unified system? So if you, if you have the, just, we keep hearing this, the stories about, you know, the, you know, the volunteer will get it. Should there be a unified system so that we don't have these big kind of paralysis of places where the word gets out? Like I said, the word, well, the only word that should get out is you have an appointment. The This other stuff is completely inconsistent with with our policies and the most important thing people need to understand is you should have an appointment. Can you explain how extra doses are utilized at mass sites in a place like Well these sites for the most part organize around appointments and they are very judicious about how much they bring out and how they use it. And you know, we've been lucky, relatively speaking, to have a, uh, an unused rate at this point, which is not just doses that get opened and don't get used. In some cases, you can't use them at all. There's chemistry involved in mix, mixing this stuff up. Um, but at this point, we're talking about an unused rate of 0.13%, uh, which, you know, my view, any dose you lose is a problem, um, but that's a pretty small number in the grand scheme of things. For exactly that reason, if you have any any anything that heads down that road is eventually going to lead 
to people starting to make assumptions about opportunity. And what I want people to understand is if you have an appointment, you'll get a vaccine. I don't want people who have appointments to worry that they might not, because that is absolutely one of the things that's driven some of this activity that's taken place at a number of these provider sites over the course of the past few weeks. People start to get this sense that, oh, you know, they hear from somebody somewhere that they're running out of vaccine and I'm not going to get my dose, even though I have an appointment. If you have an appointment, there is a vaccine there for you. And that's really the way we want people to understand that this process works, because that is the way it works. A lot of the rest of this, honestly, is, is rumor. And the, and, the, and, the, and the difficulty associated with rumor, when people are anxious to get a vaccine, um, is it will, you know, people will, based on a rumor, get in a car and drive to a site. Or they'll show up 90 minutes which has happened at a number of these locations, on provider sites as well as uh, mass vac sites, they'll show up 90 minutes before their, uh, before their appointment because they're nervous because they heard from somebody that they may not get their vaccine when they get there. If you have an appointment, there's a vaccine that's going to be there for you. So there are, uh, I do think that there are people who, um, who are what I would describe as wait and see people, okay? Um, and I'm totally um, appreciative of that particular point of view. Um, the, you know, most of the time when somebody brings out almost anything that's new, um, there are fast move. There are you know sort of first movers, fast followers, and then there's what I would call the wait and see community. And both Mike and Manny talked about uh, the fact that uh, many of the folks in um, black and brown communities have very legitimate reasons for being in a wait and see space. And one of the things we've been talking to the community health centers about is collaborating on a pretty significant. Uh, campaign, and when I talk campaign, we have a we have a two and a half million dollar media campaign. I'm talking more about sort of community-based campaigns, um, in collaboration with them, uh, to help them uh, do the work that we believe needs to be done to build some um, some optimism and some support. Uh, for getting vaccinated in some of the hardest hit communities. And, and one of the reasons I mentioned in my remarks that uh, just because you had COVID doesn't mean you shouldn't get the vaccine is because some of the communities that have been hardest hit, uh, we have anecdotal information that people say, well, you know, I got the COVID, so I don't need to get a vaccine. And um, this, is, this is just not true. And we've had, um, we've had a number of conversations with people um, who've said to us that they are hearing from their patients, they're hearing from their staff, they're hearing from their residents, they're hearing from others who are saying, well, I had, I had COVID, so I don't need to get a, a vaccine. I'm, I'm, I'm protected. And the answer to that is, uh, you really should get vaccinated because as COVID morphs into different variants, um, all those variants so far, based on the testing that's been done on the vaccines, indicates that they are effective. And that's not necessarily going to be true if you just had COVID yourself. So I would urge everybody to get vaccinated. Can I ask you one more thing about Danvers? The other problem was, I guess there were about 300 extra doses don't want thrown away, you can't refreeze them. Um, and then uh, people giving stuff, we're telling them, hey, you know, if you've got a friend, tell them to come because we don't want to throw this stuff away, which is understandable. Are you saying that the end of the day vaccine should only go to people who are eligible at phase one or 75 plus? I'm saying that the more people talk about vaccinating people who don't have appointments, the more likely it is that people who do have appointments will get concerned about whether their vaccine will be there for them. 
And that's why the message that we've given to everybody on the provider side is you should vaccinate, you should be judicious about how much you need, what you anticipate, and all the rest uh, over the course of a day. But in the end, you should be vaccinating the people who have appointments so that the people who have appointments don't end up seeing something on their phone or in their email or a text message or something else in social media that says, oh my, I might not get my vaccine even though I have an appointment. The game here is if you have an appointment, you're going to get a vaccine. But at the end of the day, uh, Secretary Snyder has told us on the conference call, it is kind of a gray area. You don't really have an official policy. You want the vaccine used. Can you clear that up at all, or is it just sort of at the discretion of each site? My view is really simple. You should vaccinate the people who have appointments, and you should be you know, smart enough about how you use the vaccine that you've got to make sure that at the end of the day, you have the vaccine you need for those people. Now, Manny told me a story about the fact that they had a situation where they had two doses, they had one dose left, two people scheduled to come. So they called one of the people and said, would you be willing to come in tomorrow morning? And they said, yes. So are you talking assurative about this? We've talked to all the providers about this. Most recently, after last night, yes. it was really chaotic. Yes, we have. Last question. And I, I just had a question. Well, Fenway Park and opening day is kind of far from now. Um, I don't know about you, but every day to me feels kind of like a month. I mean, I was I, I, thought I was 27 when this all began, and now I'm 64, and it just happened like that. Um, I think, um, I, look, I, I am very heartened by the drop we've seen in, um, in both new cases and positivity. Positivity that I announced today is below 2%. Um, I mean, these numbers are starting to get back to what they look like. I shouldn't say any more than that. I'm just going to stop. Um, but, um, but we and many other states are making a lot of progress on, uh, on our COVID numbers, which is incredibly important for sort of every aspect of life in our communities. Um, and we are getting to the point where we have more capacity than we have supply. Uh, on the vaccine piece. So for me, the big question is, when are we going to, when are we going to see the big move um, on, on federal distribution? Because we're now to the point where we, we really do have more capacity than we have supply. And let me just, let me just finish. And if, the, and, if, uh, and if there's some positive development there, it'll make a big difference with respect to how we make decisions about all kinds of things, including that. Well, for me, the big issue is going to be where are we going to be in on opening day? You know, where are we going to be in March? Um, the one of the main questions most of the governors ask on a lot of these calls with with the people in D.C. is, we're building this capacity. This capacity is designed to do a lot more dosing, um, based on presumptions that at some point there would be more supply and. Uh, and I think that's going to be an important part for all of us in terms of how we think about where we are 30 days, 60 days from now. Thanks. Thanks. Olivia Adams, the Arlington mother who created MA, MA COVID vaccines.com, said she met with people from the command center yesterday and indicated the state is looking to make a website similar to the one she rolled out. Can you give us any more details? Um, we've made a bunch of changes to the website over the course of the past 10 days. Um, the call center continues to provide pretty solid service to people who um, can't use the website who are over the age of 75. And uh, we plan to make some adjustments to the website based on input we've gotten from a lot of different places, including from uh, Olivia Adams. Could you use the companion program for uh, a place like this? Would it, would it help at all in the, in the communities? Would it have to be the companion program? I know it's from the these, these guys, first of all, Somebody just granted them a million bucks to help get people to and from their sites. Um, but these places already have relationships in many cases with trusted partners around transportation and that type of thing. Manny pointed out to me when we were talking that the PACE program, which he and I love, which basically serves very frail elders who are, are part of this community, is literally you can see it out the window. Um, and I think in many ways um, these kinds of places uh, are, are close, familiar, and local. The ones we're most concerned about are people who, um, who, who don't want to go to a big place, even though in many respects 
uh, those big places can vaccinate a lot of people in a very quick period of time. Thanks. Well, um, that's a really important job, and uh, Secretary Theoretis is, needs to figure out what to do with that. And um, and we've done a lot of great work on climate over the course of the past six years here, and we hope to anticipate we'll be able to do a lot more going forward. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. I don't know anything about that at all, Jonathan. I really don't. I mean, I wish I could help. I don't. I didn't see it. I didn't know about it. 